Hi, I'm Simon Drew, and you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to find more episodes of the show, as well as articles and information about my one-on-one alignment coaching, then you can head to my website. It's simonjedrew.com. If you do have the means to support the show, then I'd love to see you in my Patreon community. Just go to patreon.com forward slash simonjedrew where you'll also get access to over 240 episodes recorded before 2020. But for now, enjoy the show. Hey everyone, thank you so much for spending your time with me here on the Practical Stoic Podcast today. And I'm so excited to share this interview with you because I had a conversation with none other than Jules Evans. And for the life of me, I cannot figure out why it's taken me so long to get Jules on the show uh, because we have so much overlap in the way that we think about philosophy, the way that we see this philosophy in particular. Uh, and and seriously, he's so knowledgeable. He brings a wealth of information and, and wisdom to the table, uh, especially around the connections of philosophy and ecstatic experiences as well. Um, which we talk about a lot in this episode. Uh, But seriously, such a wonderful conversation. I'm excited to get into it. But before we do that, if you haven't heard of Jules before, then here's a bit of information about him. So Jules Evans is the policy director at the Centre for the History of Emotions at Queen Mary University of London. He's the author of Philosophy for Life and Other Dangerous Situations, which was published in 19 countries and was a Times Book of the Year. Jules has written for Wired, The Financial Times, and The Guardian, and is a BBC New Generation thinker. So, without any further ado, I want to present to you my conversation with the amazing Jules Evans. All right, so Jules, uh, man, I just want to say, uh, firstly, I'm so grateful that you've come on the show. I'm so grateful that I get to talk to you. Um, and you know, it was it was kind of a, an interesting moment uh, uh, about a week ago or a week and a half ago. Uh, I was talking with um, one of my one of my clients and one of my regular listeners, and an uh, amazing guy from Perth. And he said, "Man, you've got to get Jules Evans on the on the on the podcast." And I thought, "Man, why haven't I done that? Or <laughs> why haven't I already reached out to Jules and said you've got to come on the show?" And you were immediately mm. replying to me saying you know, absolutely. I'd love to come on and I really appreciate that. So Jules, I just want to give you an opportunity, maybe, uh, you know, for those people who haven't heard of your work before, maybe just explain who you are, what you do and, uh, and then we'll jump in. Okay, sure. Um, so I'm a British, um, writer, um, <clears throat> and I write about, um, ideas from, history, um, psychology, philosophy, and spirituality, and how they um, can help people flourish today. So I have quite a practical focus. But I, 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 I'm also, I work at the University of London at a place called the Centre for the History of the Emotions. Um, and I started, I, I came to academia sideways after being te- uh, doing journalism for 10 years. And so there's, I, I guess I combine uh, journalism and a kind of quite conversational voice in my writing with uh, uh, some uh, you know academic nerdy research uh, and I love the history of ideas um, in terms of stoicism I, 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 st- I started writing about stoicism um, so about uh, god uh, 12 years ago or, or more uh, about um, yeah modern stoicism um, and, and, uh, but that's not all I've written about. I've written about other things since then, but, um, uh, I guess I, I've just been interested to see the explosion of interest in stoicism in the last few years. And even though it's not exactly what I'm working on now, like, um, I, I guess I, I'm always keen to, to, to direct people to my, the work I have done on stoicism. Um, so that's partly why I wanted to do this interview. Mm, absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm grateful that you did. And, and, and what was it that, you know, I think uh, it was Donald Robertson, he kind of put it that a lot of people have sort of like a conversion story when they talk about the, the way that they came to stoicism. 
Uh, yeah. w- was there a, a, a moment for you where you were like, wow, this really clicks for me? And, and, and if so, like, why did it click for you so much? Sure. Um, so the very brief version is that um, I had uh, emotional problems when I was uh, in my late teens and early 20s. Um, I was a, 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 a raver. Uh, and was into kind of um, my friends and I took a fair amount of drugs between the age of 15 and 18 uh, and some of us were fine with that but some of us slightly damaged ourselves with it like with things like LSD and MDMA and I rather hurt myself with a couple of bad trips on LSD when I was 18 and I developed um, post-traumatic stress. Uh, I then got I had that for about five or six years um and had like depression and panic attacks and social anxiety and so on uh, and I got better th- through the first thing that helped me was um a strange kind of near-death experience which I won't go into now but I've written about it in the past it, I, I wrote about it, I think in I think I mentioned it in all my books but um it was a kind of it was a it was a bad um a skiing accident and then had a kind of white light type experience and mm. it's relevant to this story in terms of the thing that that experience gave me was the sense that what was causing my suffering was my own beliefs um uh, and i realized i didn't have to keep on thinking these anxious thoughts i could i could learn to trust myself learn to trust what epictetus calls like the god within and that there was something within me which was kind of fine and undamaged. So that was extremely lucky and, and really helped me um, overcome or, or just kind of leave behind um, my, my very negative, anxious thoughts and beliefs. But as the Stoics teach us, um, thoughts and, and beliefs and emotions are habitual. So it, and sometimes it's not enough to just have one epiphany because the old habits are quite ingrained. And that's what happened with me. The old habits of depression and anxiety came back. Hmm. So I realized I needed more than just this one-off epiphany. I needed a kind of daily training to strengthen my new beliefs and habits. Um, And I'd heard of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I don't know where I first heard of it, but um, I went along to a a support group for people who suffer from social anxiety. This must have been in 2002, 2003, um, and practiced cognitive behavioral exercises with this group. There was was no therapist present. Um, Just one person in the group had uh, a bootleg copy of of a CBT course for social anxiety. And that very much helped me and helped me, um, overcome um you know stop having panic uh control and change my uh, difficult emotions and cbt seemed quite similar to stoicism to me i'd read a very little bit of stoicism at that point i think maybe i had a copy of marcus aurelius's meditations and i thought this is this is this is basically stoicism isn't it um in 2007, I went to interview the people who invented CBT, uh, the American psychologist Albert Ellis, um, who invented something called rational emotive behavior therapy, and, um, and Aaron Beck, the inventor of um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, I ended up uh, doing the last ever interview with Albert Ellis uh, in 2007. I, li- I interviewed him on his deathbed in a hospital in New York. <laughs> Wow. Um, but I got, I, I thanked him for this therapy, which had helped me and uh, obviously millions of other people. And I, and I asked both Beck and Ellis where they got the inspiration for um, their cognitive therapies. And they both told me that the direct inspiration was stoicism. Um, and specifically the quote of Epictetus, um, people are disturbed not by events, but by their opinion about events. They'd both been trained in Freudian psychoanalysis, but felt their patients weren't getting better from things like depression, even when they saw them sometimes every day for weeks and months and years. Hmm. And particularly Ellis, who I think was the real pioneer, he was an extraordinary autodidact. He'd been a a traveling pants salesman 
who then like taught himself philosophy and psychology and become a Freudian. And then through his very wide reading, he'd come across the Stoics and Epictetus and thought maybe this is the way in, the way to heal people. Rather than focusing on repressed childhood trauma, focusing on their thoughts and opinions in, in you know, the everyday. Um, and, their, and also their values as well. So, um, and I guess I just thought this is extraordinary and this isn't being talked about enough. The fact that this, you know, by that point, uh, this, by 2007, cognitive behavioral therapy was hugely well established. Um, it was just at that point, really, that people started in, in the UK, um, there was a movement to make, to launch a new cognitive behavioral therapy kind of national mental health service. Um, you know, to massively increase the number of CBT therapists to make it freely available to the general public. And the house I'm living at the moment in, in Bristol, my housemate is, uh, is part of this National Mental Health Service. So she, she's providing CBT um, for free to people on our National Health Service. There was also a big move to teach CBT techniques in schools through what's called positive psychology. So there was this whole politics of, of, of making these techniques available to people and no one was saying this comes from stoicism and i thought isn't this extraordinary that this this ancient philosophy um, is basically the basis of of our most evidence-based therapy and it's now being provided to millions of people and we've almost got a politics of stoic techniques and why isn't anyone writing about this so i i thought that was extraordinary and i was also interested in whether people today were consciously using stoicism uh, and I wanted to find those people and interview them. So in 2008 I started um, blogging uh, back when it was still cool uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I started a blog called The Politics of Wellbeing which was basically about the overlap between ancient Greek philosophy, modern psychology and politics. Mm. Um, and as part of that, uh, and I, I'll finish, so I know I'm banging on, this, this is the end of it, sorry, I've given you a long no, go answer. On. Uh, well, as part of that, um, I started to try and track down modern Stoics on the internet. Uh, anyone who mentioned Stoicism uh, and how it had been used in their life, because I knew how useful it was in my life. And so I thought there must be other people out there. And I just wanted to interview them for my blog. And I came across um, something called back then called the Stoic Registry, um, which had been set up, I think, in the late 90s by an American uh, man called Eric Weigart. And um, I met Eric online and I, I started to write the, the, the Stoic uh, Registry's uh, a monthly magazine, online magazine. And I would... Uh, and the Stoic Registry was a place where people could go and say, I'm a modern Stoic, and they join the registry and, and write a little paragraph on themselves. I think it's still going. And so I, th partly through that, I guess, tracked down people who were using Stoicism and interviewed them. Uh, and I interviewed all kinds of people, like the, the former mayor of Vancouver, um, who, was, uh, who was very you know, into practicing Stoicism, uh, Thomas Jarrett, Major Thomas Jarrett, who'd been teaching kind of Stoic resilience in Baghdad to American soldiers, uh, Stoic firemen, Stoic policemen, um, all kinds of people. And also I was tracking down modern um, psychologists uh, and uh, philosophers who are into modern Stoicism. So I interviewed Donald Robertson. That was the first ever YouTube interview I did. That was in 2008. And Donald seemed to be the only other person who was interested in the relationship between Stoicism and CBT. So it was great to meet him. And mm. people like Martha Nussbaum, who's a, 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 very, a very famous modern philosopher who's, who's into kind of uh, Stoic practices. Um, and yeah, so I just built up this, this kind of, this database of stories um and um I, I put them together into my first book so the first book i wrote was called philosophy for life and other dangerous situations and initially it was going to be a book just about stoicism 
But back then, it was hard to sell a book on modern Stoicism. <laughs> it was too niche. Um, you know, we, Eric and I organized a first kind of Stoicon in 2010 um, in San Diego. So the first gathering of, of modern Stoics for, for 2,000 years, let's say, mm. if you don't count the neo-Stoics of the Renaissance. So we organized, and like 10 people came, and that, you know, it was... Uh, which we thought was pretty good, <laughs> you know, like mm. it was, it was so niche. And I said to my friends, yeah, I'm going to San Diego for a gathering of Stoics, you know, and to celebrate Marcus Aurelius's birthday. And they thought this was incredibly eccentric. Uh, you know, I mean, it'd be, it'd be like saying, I'm going, <laughs> I'm going into the forest for a gathering of Pythagoreans. Mm. I mean, it'd just be so, so kind of niche. <laughs> um, but so, you know, like I was told, yeah, I don't know, you know, book on modern stoicism, that's, that's too niche. So I ended up expanding it to be not just about modern stoicism, but about modern stoicism and modern Epicureanism and modern Platonism. So basically, I, I, I shaped the book as a kind of uh, a version of Raphael's School of Athens. Uh, if you know that wonderful Renaissance painting, which shows all the ancient philosophers hanging out mm. together so i said imagine going to that dream school and so the stoics taught in the morning then the epicureans then plato and so on and 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 just populated it with stories of people who'd used all these different philosophies today and um yeah that came out in 2012 and it did it did really well um and and it's it's come out in like 21 countries now and it was just at this moment where there's more and more interest in ancient philosophy and practical philosophy and more and more books came out, started to come out about it. And I suppose like the pioneer, one of the pioneers in a way was, well, there's been a few, but like Alan de Botton, he, he wrote his book, The Constellations of Philosophy in 1999. So he was kind of ahead of the curve. Mm. Um, and do you, I mean, I could tell you a bit about um the the kind of modern stoicism movement i mean like the the the, the seminar that started that but but i do you want to ask any, anything you want to ask absolutely yeah well well yeah i'd, I'd love to talk about that and I, I just first want to say i mean like uh wow <laughs> you know th thank you so much for uh the work that you put in because it seems like you were obviously on the forefront of you know this massive wave that was about to start happening in the world where people were kind of um, you know, I guess waking up to the value of these ancient ideas. And I think well, that it's it represents... Been it's it, been amazing it, what's happened. It, it is amazing. It's beautiful to see this. And do, do you think that... I see this kind of trend happening, and you might agree or disagree. I think that, you know, like the 70s, 80s, 90s, that was kind of the era of the the modern sort of personal development kind of movement, you know, and so you had all these motivational speakers and, um, and, and a lot of the ideas that even they were teaching, uh, honestly, you can draw them back to these ancient philosophers. They just put them in a, a more modern kind of um, maybe a more woo woo kind of, uh, kind of application. Uh, yeah. But do you feel as though people are moving away from the motivation movement and going towards something a little bit more deep, a little bit more meaningful, uh, not necessarily how can I get more stuff, but how can I just genuinely live a more fulfilling life? Yes, I suppose so. Um, I, would, I would say two things. Um, first of all, I think that modern stoicism is often taught as a form of you know more that kind of um consumer self-help mm, yeah so you know there's a bit of an overlap like some people are probably into it more for like genuinely trying to develop virtue but some people i mean like you've had books like maria konnikova wrote a book about learning stoic techniques in order to become a poker champion for mm. example um or um you have lot you know i mean um, Ryan Holiday has done extraordinary work in terms of spreading Stoicism extremely wide, probably more than anyone. But, uh, uh, you know, he, I would say to some extent he's, he's, he's tapping into that kind of 
motivation, how to be a success in business and in life kind of field. Mm. So, um, uh, and I, 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 so I, you know, I, I it, it wouldn't be my kind of stoicism that, but I nonetheless think he should be applauded for spreading these ideas so far. And, and he's still referring to like Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus. And so even if it's a rather strange gateway, I still think it's getting people to the basic good stuff. Mm. Um, but the other thing I was going to say is I think one of the reasons people have got interested in ancient Greek philosophy was because of the massive interest in ancient Eastern philosophy. Um, yeah. And because of the spread of yoga and mindfulness. And I think that just got people, I mean, just initially people were very, you know, and have been for like a century into like, oh, the ancient wisdom of the East. Um, and, and I think one of the attractions for me about Stoicism was this was a way to connect to the, 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 the kind of forgotten treasures of Western culture. Hmm. Um, uh, and, and, and I, I, I guess that was, that was attractive to me to like, as, as, as an autodidact, I hadn't studied the classics really at school or university, just, you know, discovering people like Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus, but also people like Plato and Aristotle and realizing these are accessible, these are really beautiful, and these are key ideas for our culture, which then um, grow all the way through Western culture, through um, Christian culture, through the Renaissance, through the Enlightenment, through the 19th century. So for me, it was very, it was, it was a way to discover my culture, really, um, and, and, and the kind of roots of it and, and the branches of it. And I, I really like that. And um, so, I, yeah, I, I guess, in, in other words, one doesn't have to learn um, you know, Hindu or Tibetan Buddhist wisdom um, to, to have a kind of practical philosophy which helps you with the difficulties of life and helps you to transform yourself. You can also find similar wisdom in, in Western culture. So I, I think that might have been one of the reasons. It was, it was a kind of post... 70s post that 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 huge surge of interest in eastern wisdom i think people realized oh there's actually very similar ideas in western wisdom as well mm. yeah you, you you're speaking my language jules i tell you what because it's um <laughs> you know th this is all stuff that i've been really trying to get to the bottom of uh, lately and and mm. and my listeners will attest to that i've been really interested in kind of the uh, you know, for example, I'm, I'm having Sharon LaBelle come on in a couple of weeks to do an interview about uh, the similarities between Buddhism and Stoicism. And in many ways, I actually feel as though people like Seneca, um, you know, the, the ideas that he taught offer almost uh, the, the Western version of the middle way, you know, that, that, that line between, um, you know, focusing inwardly on yourself and trying to aim at virtue and your own spiritual progress, as well mm. as not being too far out from culture and, and the people around you so that they still understand you. I think he had a quote, it was like, uh, people should admire, uh, th there should be some distinction between you and the crowd, yet people should still understand the way that you live. Um, but, but, but do you think that, You're right. sorry, go on. Well, you're right that Stoicism is much more a form of um, almost kind of monastic self-detachment, but for people in the world, more so than Buddhism. Mm. Uh, ancient Buddhism was taught for monks who retreat to a Sangha. Um, it, uh, so, and I suppose it's more comparable to something like the Bhagavad Gita in Hinduism, which was a form of spiritual practice and spiritual you know, uh, spiritual wisdom, but for people who are householders, who have jobs and families. So I suppose similar uh, stoicism is a bit comparable to that. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. I wanted to ask uh, something that I was kind of thinking the other day is, uh, I was thinking back to um, a lecture of Alan Watts that I heard, and he was kind of yeah. talking about uh, how th there's... There's a certain, I don't want to say danger, there's a certain caution that people in Western culture should take when 
they jump into, say, an ancient philosophy or religion such as the ones found in Eastern philosophies. Um, I guess because we, we don't necessarily have the thousands of years of, of, you know, culture behind us and understanding of their way of life to, to really understand exactly uh, how to do it properly. Uh, right. Do you think that um, these Western philosophies like uh, Stoicism and, 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 you know, Epicureanism and, and, and all these beautiful ideas uh, kind of slot into our way of life a lot easier because they are in very, mu- in very many ways uh, the roots of what we already have been uh, kind of evolved culturally to believe? Uh, I think so, yes. Um, they are they're right at the centre of Western culture. You can't watch, um, you know, Shakespeare's Hamlet without coming across uh, Stoicism. You can't read um, the ideas of the American founding fathers without coming across Stoicism and Epicureanism. Um, they influence uh, Adam Smith, Immanuel Kant, uh, Victorian thinkers, so they're they're just they're they're really everywhere, uh, and 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 Stoicism is is not very esoteric, uh, unlike say Platonism and Neoplatonism. It's not just for an initiated elite. It's it's for everybody, and it's very practical. I mean, I've given talks on Stoicism to every conceivable audience, uh, uh, different ages, different backgrounds and classes. I've given talks about it in. To, to professional soccer clubs. I've given talks about it to kind of uh, 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 high security prisons. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very easy to, to explain and understand. But um, yeah, I think it's, and it's, that's funny. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm researching Alan Watts and Aldous Huxley at the moment. And, you know, those guys did so much to introduce Eastern wisdom to the West. Uh, and and I, I give a talk about Aldous Huxley and I talk about like mysticism for the masses. Like they were teaching these mystical techniques, which used to be for a, a tiny group of monks and nuns. And they were saying, everybody can learn them, you know, and Alan Watts more than anyone. Uh, he, you know, he was a kind of popular entertainer giving, you know, his radio TV shows about Zen Buddhism and, and mm. talks on the radio and then traveling around America, giving like a talk a night to his kind of devoted hippie student followers. So, so they were really teaching these mystical techniques uh, for a mass audience. But I do think there are risks to that because mystical training is designed to help you go beyond your ego and connect to the divine. And that's a very hard journey and it's often a scary journey. And I think sometimes people are, uh, are trying out mystical ideas or you know, taking psychedelics and having mystical experiences that they are not prepared for and then having to go back to their ordinary lives and ordinary jobs and ordinary uh, conventional identities, having had some mind blowing experience. And I think that can be pretty hard. So mm. that's definitely, I mean, it's a bit off topic to Stoicism, but that's definitely something that interests me. And I think Stoicism is like, I I, I think it's, it's, it's just a useful stage and a useful skill to have. Um, I I think the journey is, is much longer than that. And I think you need other skills as well and other ideas as well. But I think Stoicism is very useful uh, training. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm more than happy going off topic because I think that a lot of what you have to say, um, for example, with your, uh, your research into ecstatic experiences and spiritual experiences around the world, uh, I'm really trying to understand how that side of, uh, of the scientific evolution at the moment can mm. influence stoicism and how stoicism can influence that kind of research as well. Because you said yeah. that, you know, these people having these experiences where they go beyond their ego and connect with the divine. And yeah, you know, I, could, I could point out so many quotes from Seneca, from Marcus Aurelius, from Epictetus yeah. that yeah. make me believe that there's something that we might be missing about the spiritual side of Stoicism where they were able to go beyond their ego and connect with whether they called it universal nature 
whether they called it Zeus. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they did call it Providence and the divine. Yeah. Can, you, can you speak to that element of Stoicism? Yeah. Well, um, I am not, I don't want to preach to anybody. Uh, mm. And I guess what, um, what I liked about Stoicism was these are very practical ideas and techniques which can help you um, no matter, you know, what um, metaphysics you have. Um, so mod- modern Stoicism, you know, has, has taken a lot of ideas and techniques from ancient Stoicism, but it's often dropped the metaphysics. So it's dropped mm. the ancient Stoics idea that, that um, the universe is alive and connected by a, um, a divine intelligence called the Logos. Um, uh, and, I, and I'm fine with that. I have no desire to scold anyone for having different metaphysics to me. I just want, you know, I'm interested in providing ideas and, and, and techniques which help people and people throughout history have come to stoicism and, and, and used it in a pragmatic way, um, to help them, uh, you know, and, and, and I guess have attached it to different kinds of, uh, belief systems, Christian, Muslim, uh, enlightenment, atheist, and so on. So I'm, I'm fine with that. I really am. Uh, and I've written, I wrote an article called like the, 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 the you know, in praise of the the broad messy church of modern stoicism like you know i like the fact that you know you could have atheists like darren brown being into it and also christian stoics and also you know buddhist stoics and so on so i'm i'm really fine with that um i guess speaking personally i personally found that those stoicism had hugely helped me um come through this this crisis in my life there felt like a stage where I needed something else. Um, uh, I needed, I, I guess I was looking for more community than I could find in modern Stoicism. Uh, and I, I haven't been very successful in finding that, by the way. Um, uh, but, and I was also looking for something that would help me with, um, I suppose I had a model of the psyche um, where you know one's rational consciousness isn't all of it. And that there are deeper, like subliminal aspects to the psyche and that one can connect with and heal those more subconscious or subliminal aspects of the psyche through other methods. Um, so I'll, I can talk about that in a bit. But just to go mm. to your point, um, you're right that in, in the ancient Stoics, there are, there are descriptions of, you know, spiritual moments of connection. Uh, Seneca standing in a forest and feeling profoundly connected to it. Um, so many of the passages in Marcus Aurelius talking about the universe as an interconnected whole uh, or as an interconnected web, um, or Epictetus talking about learning to be true to the God within you. Um, so yes, there is a kind of a, 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 a slight mystical strain to ancient Stoicism, which I think you hear much more in Plato. Um, and, and we shouldn't forget that some, you know, a lot of the ancient Stoics were also initiates of mystery cults. So Marcus Aurelius would also have been an initiate at the cult of Eleusis. Uh, so was Socrates. I'm not sure about Epictetus or Seneca, but certainly Cicero said that the greatest gift that uh, ancient Greece gave to the rest of the world was not philosophy, but the cult of Eleusis. Um, by which he said people die with a better hope. And, you know, we don't know that much about what happened at this mystery cult, but I, it was certainly seemed quite mind altering. And to me, it sounds like very similar to a modern psychedelic experience. Like uh, Plutarch talks about how at the cult of Eleusis, you go, well, you go on a pilgrimage, then you, you drink a potion and then you descend to the underworld and it's dark and frightening and scary and the body shakes. And, but then you emerge into blissful light and feel yourself like reborn and, re- and connected to your fellow initiates. So to me, that sounds quite psychedelic. Um, mm-hmm. And, and we, it may be that their initiation into these mystery cults helped to inform their rather spiritual ideas of the Logos. Because of course, when 
when people take psychedelics, they, they often have animist experiences where they feel connected to a living universe in not just a rational way, but an extremely deep, physical, intuitive sense of that connection to a living universe. Mm. Um, so it's, it's always interesting to, when one thinks about ancient Greece is, uh, you know, the, the balance of different forces and powers and ideas within that culture. You see, it was the most rational culture um, that had ever existed up to that point. But they also had this appreciation for the non-rational, um, which, they, which they paid homage to through things like um, the cult of Eleusis, through things like the, the cult of Dionysus. Um, do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, so there's this balance of um, the Socratic and rational and the non-rational or Dionysiac. And that was um, why, you know, after I wrote this book about the Socratic rational approach to flourishing, I wrote a second book about the kind of Dionysian ecstatic approach to flourishing, not because I was rejecting the old Socratic ideas uh, or, or Stoicism, but because I thought it was about balancing out these different aspects of one's being. Um, and that it was, I mean, so I wrote a book, The Art of Losing Control, looking at what are ecstatic experiences? When are they good for us? When are they bad for us? How do we find them today in modern life? What does psychology tell us about them? And, and I looked at all different kinds of ways from psychedelics to intense meditation, to church, to rock and roll, to nature. And what I conclude is like, you need both aspects to this, to your psyche that a, um, a purely, a spirituality purely based on spiritual experiences risks becoming, em, you know, uh, empty thrill seeking. Uh, so you need a kind of daily Socratic practice to ground your spiritual experiences and turn altered states into altered traits. And likewise, I think it can be helpful if you are, if you have a daily Socratic or Buddhist practice to be open to the occasional mystical experience um, because otherwise it can become rather arid and boring. Um, so, mm. it, I, you know, that's what I mean about balancing out the Socratic and the Dionysiac. And that could be as simple as finding times to dance, for example, or being open to like falling in love or maybe, you know, being, a, uh, that, did you see what I mean? That, that kind of thing. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and seriously, Jules, like there, there's at least 25 reasons why everything that you said there um, really resonated with me. Like I've, I've been yearning for this kind of conversation for a long time because I, I have felt so strongly that there, there, there is another side to stoicism that isn't purely based on, uh, you know, rationality is everything. Um, and especially yeah. when you see people like uh, uh, Rupert Sheldrake, you know, coming out with, with new theories of, of science based on almost the, the, the theory of the soul, you know, and the soul of the universe. Yeah. And um, yeah, one of the I things interviewed, that's... I interviewed him last week, Rupert Sheldrake. Oh, wonderful, man. He, he's, he's brilliant. And yeah. something that really um, has been toying with my mind lately is mm. uh, this idea of a more fatty... Um, because if you want to think about the very rational side of our mind, it seems to me that there's nothing more irrational than just acting as if everything in life that happens could be good for you. <laughs> it seems like it's not a very rational approach to say, well, you know what? I will accept my fate no matter what it is because terrible things happen to us. And what we're just in those moments supposed to act as if, you know what, it's okay. I'll get through this. Right. But yeah. When I think about that, that idea of acting as if the universe probably knows better than you is yeah. almost identical to what I was taught growing up in church, which was that, mm. Hey, listen, uh, there's something bigger than you. It's called mm. God's plan. Let's say nature's plan. Let's say whatever happens in nature because you can't control it. Um, yeah. But if something happens to you, 
use it as an opportunity to grow, to learn, to find out how you could accept it and allow it to influence you. And, and so there's all of these similarities between the, the things that we tend to call out as the most irrational, you know, like there's no room for religion. There's no room for, uh, for that yeah. sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, these ideas uh, yeah. are very much based on the model of there's much more, there's much bigger things outside of my own overthinking brain. Right. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, have you read a book, by William James called the varieties of religious experience. I have not, but I'm going to write that down right now. Well, that's yeah. great. Cause you will love it. Mm. Uh, you will really enjoy it. It's one of the most important books for me. Uh, he was definitely very into stoicism, but he, I mean, and William James was the, the kind of one of the great American psychologists and philosophers. He, mm-hmm. he pretty much started up American psychology and he was a, a founding father of this school called pragmatism. He um, he says um, that. Oh, am I, am I still here? Yeah. So you, <laughs> you you cut out for a moment, but you you were just talking about how he's the founder of uh, pragmatism. Pragmatism. Yeah. Uh, and he says, I mean, it's just a brilliant book in terms of providing a rational, scientific, uh, empirical justification for certain kind of uh, religious practices and also for the idea of the pragmatic use of um, living as if the universe is benevolent. And he Mm. says, it may be true, it may be not, but it's quite a useful idea. And so he says, we should behave as if it was true. And that will, that will kind of be a helpful idea for our life. And I suppose there are problems with that as well, because we want to try and, believe what's true not not just what's helpful but nonetheless i i just really recommend this book because he, he's such a great writer as well he writes beautifully um mm. yeah but, I'm, I'm definitely gonna i'm definitely gonna jump into that because I'm, I'm looking for as much stimulus as i can possibly get my hands on to yeah. learn more about uh yeah. this new emerging science of what is outside like like what are the limits to our consciousness or to our rationality yeah i mean there's there's interesting stuff in that but i know what you mean i mean we can think about the lockdown and and the pandemic for example i mean you're in australia so you're you're probably post lockdown but we're still struggling with it here in the uk and it's been a real mess and and i remember when it happened you know when it first the, the, the the pandemic really first took off i had lots of kind of um, spiritual friends on Facebook posting things like, um, oh, COVID-19 is our friend. It is a teacher. It has come here to teach us wisdom. Mm. And they were writing poems to, to COVID-19. And I, I felt like, well, this is, no, COVID-19 is a killer, you know, and we're like, uh, <laughs> we're, in a, we're in a Darwinian struggle here. And, and this is, and, and, you know, millions are, are going are, are gonna to suffer and, and, you know, may, millions, might, millions will die probably. Um, but so, and I think it's, it's kind of okay to say, this is bad. This is, this is, this is not fun. Um, otherwise there's a risk of kind of spiritual bypass, you know, like, um, mm. everything's fine, everything's cool, you know, uh, and you're actually denying your, your difficult emotions under a veneer of serenity. So mm. it's okay to say things are hard. But there are also moments when you say, yes, but it, I guess it isn't all bad. Um, you know, that there, there are um, silver linings to this, that there's this moment of enforced pause and reflection um, can be kind of helpful and fruitful. So I suppose it's about just not being, about being nuanced, uh, you know, that not being too glib in, in one's cosmic optimism. Uh, mm. uh, and, 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 and being open to moments of uncertainty. The fact is, of course, we can't really know for sure what the nature of the universe is, um, whether there really is a kind of guiding providence, um, whether there's some kind of cosmic plan, what happens, we just don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm reading, I'm researching Aldous Huxley and his grandfather was Thomas Huxley, who was one of the great scientists of the Victorian era and, um, you know, kind of right-hand man to Charles Darwin. And Thomas Huxley coined the word agnostic. Um, 
as in, you know, he's not, we just don't know. I mean, we can shrug our shoulders and, and can we, can we learn to live with that uncertainty of not knowing But I, I hope, and I guess I have a, um, a kind of unexamined sense that there is some kind of higher power, um, uh, and some kind of cosmic plan. And I guess that's partly because of that near death experience I had years ago, but mm. I'm totally open to the possibility that I'm wrong. Uh, and, 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 you know, and, and it, it's, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm researching a lot of kind of mystical scientists at the moment from the, like the 20th century. And I more and more realize it's, it's far too simplistic to say there's some kind of opposition between science and faith. And it's, it's, it's better to say that we all operate under faith systems mm. uh, and humanism is also a faith system and capitalism is a faith system and so on. Uh, and I, I, I think it's about, you know, trying to recognize that your faith system is, is a faith system and it's, you know, it's not going to be the whole truth. Um, so uh, having that kind of skepticism and, and, and critical faculty towards one's own, own belief systems. But at the same time, you've got to get on with living life and you can't kind of examine your beliefs, you know, critically and skeptically every hour. So to some extent we do have these, what, what William James called over beliefs, you know, like guiding faiths and, and, and we kind of live with them and use them for a bit. And then we maybe at certain points in our life, we think, is this philosophy still serving me? Um, or do I need to like amend it? And then, you know, we cobble together some other kind of life philosophy and we live with that for a bit. And these are like boats that we try to sail across the ocean of life with. And then we think, oh, this boat's not really serving me anymore. I need to kind of uh, change the sail or something. And then we try that. But it's always involves a certain amount of uncertainty and, and that's okay. Mm, yeah, no, ab- absolutely. And, and, and I agree. I, th- I think that it's far too simplistic to place yourself on one side of the aisle and say, there's simply no value to the religious experience or to, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I tend to believe that everybody worships something. Um, it, it's yeah. just, you know, some people just kind of break away like I, I did, um, you know, from, yeah. from the church side of things. And, yeah. and you might say that a lot of people are using stoicism as almost a religious experience and, and, you know, I really, yeah. I'm, I'm very well, interested in, in your, uh, your research into ecstatic experiences. Cause okay. uh, to be honest, um, if, if there was one thing that I think would be enough for people to actually realize maybe I'm not just this thinking mind, it would be say a psychedelic experience, but <laughs> I wanted to, yeah. um, jump over to you and, and, could could you explain? Uh, so you, you're researching these ecstatic experiences. Firstly, what is an ecstatic experience, um, in your definition? And then and then, what do you think are the most common ones that we see in society today? And 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 what do you think we'll see moving forward? Uh, I define an ecstatic experience. It comes from the ancient Greek word ecstasis, which means standing outside. So an ecstatic experience is a moment when you stand outside your ordinary sense of self or your ordinary ego. Um, And usually it's accompanied by uh, what the Greeks called enthusiasmos, um, which means entheos, having a God within. So it's it's a moment where you stand outside of your ordinary self, you go beyond your ordinary little everyday self, and you feel profoundly connected to something greater than you. Mm. Um, now, for the ancient Greeks, that would usually be a kind of god or spirit, likewise in, in Christian mysticism. Um, but, of course, um, you know, in the modern era, uh, ever since the Enlightenment, people have reinterpreted ecstasy as connection to different kinds of things. So there's been, like, the Romantics had what one academic called natural supernaturalism. So, you know, romantic poets would have ecstatic experiences, but they would feel connected to nature or to the sublime, or if you're uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, perhaps uh, ecstatic connection to the the general will of the nation. Um, So uh, you have, you would have, you could have modern 
uh, atheists who who would uh, like like Aldous Huxley's brother Julian Huxley who talk about uh, an ecstatic connection to the ecosystem or to Gaia or you could have an ecstatic connection to a group of people or to another person like your lover or a friend um, so what you connect to is 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 quite you know uh, there there are variants possible to it um it's but it's this powerful kind of altered state and altered sense of self and it's 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 a kind of the, the borders of yourself dissolve and you feel connected to something beyond it it can be often very euphoric and people think of ecstasy as being meaning very very happy but that's not always the case so ecstatic experiences can also be very uh, frightening um you might feel possessed that's a kind of ecstatic experience or you just might not know what's going on uh you've gone beyond your ordinary everyday sense of self your ordinary map of reality and that can be um very disorientating and it can be difficult to come back you are not the same person as Aldous Huxley said the man who goes through the door in the wall is not the same person as the man who comes back and um i mean the book that i've just edited a book about spiritual emergencies called um breaking open uh and that's about this kind of niche or this subset of ecstatic experiences which are kind of messy and scary where people uh feel an altered sense of self and reality for extended period of time for like weeks or months mm. uh and so the book is about how to help people who have that kind of experience so um so that's roughly how i define an ecstatic experience it's but psychologists have not written much about it but when they do they've called it well william james called it religious experience um abraham maslow called it peak experiences people talk about like i think um what's he called um uh, sam harris talks about self transcendent experiences others talk about altered states of consciousness so there's 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 different kinds of terms you can use but i think they're all talking about that kind of experience mm. uh and you could also talk about trance experiences or possession experiences so anthropologists talk a lot, a lot about trance and possession experiences um so yeah most cultures around the world have ecstatic rituals to try and help people go beyond their ordinary self and you know get in touch with something beyond them and what what aristotle says is that a healthy culture needs ecstatic rituals and aristotle interprets these experiences purely psychologically he says what people are doing is achieving catharsis they are managing to let loose all the kind of nervous tension in their minds and bodies that civilization builds up so they go along to like say a dionysian dance cult and they dance the entire night and this helps them achieve catharsis like to purge the nervous tension of everyday life and that helps them to return to civilization and be happier um but in in western culture since um i mean at least uh, the 17th century we because we became became very rational we became quite suspicious of ecstasy particularly of religious ecstasy we thought mm. this would threaten the individual with madness um and society with kinds of irrationalist cults or dangerous irrationalist movements like nazism for example so there was a strong taboo against ecstatic experiences and western psychiatry tended to say ecstatic experiences are just forms of mental illness um the psychiatrists label ecstasy as um hysteria or psychosis or bipolar disorder and so on so we have a very inbuilt uh, kind of taboo against um ecstatic experiences um but what people like Aldous Huxley said and I agree is actually these experiences are very a uh, uh, natural and just happen to humans all the time and we need healthy ways to get this experience otherwise we will seek unhealthy ways to get this kind of experience like um uh addiction to alcohol or addiction to um opiates or um addiction to technology or to porn or addiction to kind of what he called um the greatest intoxicant at all of all rather which is nationalism mm. um so um so he thought we needed things like 
you know, mystical practices or psychedelics or ecstatic cults um, as, a, as a way to give us access to this kind of experience, as a way to go beyond our ordinary self, because we kind of know that our ordinary self is not the whole story. We know that there's a lot more to our psyches and that, that in some ways we're kind of living on volcanoes, that there's this tremendous power always there beneath our ordinary psyches. And the question is, how do we tap into that power? And this is what fascinated William James. How do we tap into that extraordinary human potential that's always there, just, just, just beyond our ordinary self, and yet, on the whole, unused? Um, uh, mm. So, yeah, how do people find this kind of experience today? Um, obviously, things like yoga and Eastern meditation became hugely popular in the 60s. Um, now something like one in four people meditate in Britain or have tried meditation, something like one in seven or one in eight in America practice some form of Eastern practice like yoga. So that, you know, that would be one of the most popular, um, you know, then of course, psychedelics are increasingly popular, um, things like rock and roll um, and festivals and, and rave music would be another very important way that again evolved during the 60s as a kind of secular ecstatic cult. Um, mm. Then you have nationalism and that kind of nationalist tribalism making very much a comeback in the last few years. Um, and then probably most of all booze um mm. that aldous huxley loved to quote you know i mean william james talks about alcohol as as a kind of a, a, an easy path to the mystical experience we all feel kind of lonely and uh, bored and isolated in our egos but then we, we 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 create these rituals where we go for some drinks with friends and it just dissolves a little bit the walls of our ego and the walls of our ordinary inhibition and we get a kind of boozy communion with our friends and that's nice <laughs> you know that's good. Mm. that's kind of you know that civilization depends on that um so that's the kind of that's but that's pretty low level mysticism right i mean you know, you're not you're not getting very far but it's still fun <laughs> <laughs> yeah no absolutely this this is such interesting stuff and i, I I'm, I'm so grateful that i get to live in a time where we're exploring all of this sort of stuff because it, it's so important. And, and th this idea of going outside yourself, you know, I, I've, I've felt for a while now that um, of the ec ecstatic experiences that I have received, which, which um, may be more of, you know, de definitely um, higher than, than the, you know, going out for drinks with a friend. Um, yeah. I have, I have felt as though, um, it, it, it's almost as if you you go beyond the rational level and you're sitting above yeah. yourself viewing even your own rationality and viewing it yeah. for all of its flaws and all of its <clears throat> inadequacies. And you're saying, I, yeah, of course, I, I'm not just a rational being. I'm full of all sorts of problems, all sorts of inadequacies, all sorts of um, you know, questionable thoughts, but, but that's okay. Right. It's, it's yeah. like, it, there's, there's a calmness that comes from, from these experiences yeah. that teaches you that you're imperfect. You're pretty much an idiot. You're just a, a, a bumbling mess, but that's absolutely fine. Um, and then when you pair yeah. that with philosophy, this yeah. thing that teaches you to love wisdom, to love and wonder about the world to constantly want to know more about how yeah. you can experience this world in a, in a deeper level. I think that those two paired together, it's such a winning combination. If you're able to match it with the discipline and if you're able mm. to match it with, if, if you're able to, as you've said, you kind of not allow the ego to come along on the journey. Right. And, and yeah. I want to know, how do you, how do you, how would you encourage people to, have these experiences, but to be wary or cautious of the fact that the ego does at times like to jump on and, and maybe allow you to lie to yourself about what you've experienced. Um, I suppose the first thing I would say is the, um, 
ecstatic experience is quite a kind of grand term that I use, but in some ways these, these kinds of things are very ordinary and everyday mm. um, because our, I suppose, you know, what, what Buddhism tries to teach us and maybe Stoicism a bit the same is, is a bit of t- detachment from our ordinary conventional idea of ourself. Mm. Um, and that our ordinary conventional idea of ourself are just habits uh, and those habits uh, are not eternal and, and carved in stone and they're all changeable. And that if we can loosen those habits and see through them a little bit, uh, we see how we are connected to the all. And this can help us. First of all, it's a, that's a beautiful experience. And secondly, it helps us to be um, more compassionate to others and to recognize our profound, mysterious connection to others. Um, so, and, and, and that can be every day. I think that can be, that can be an everyday thing. It doesn't have to be, you know, that can happen in big and little ways. One can have just a feeling of friendliness and companionship when one's having a cup of tea with a friend and then all all the way up to the kind of almost rapturous feeling of love, you know, on your wedding day, for example, or something like Mm. that, or when you, you know, when you give birth. So there's a continuum. Um, and, and it just happens all the time. And I think, you know, not to, not to say that that kind of thing is woo woo and that won't happen to me because it's no big deal. It's perfectly natural and normal. Um, it doesn't mean you're crazy, but I think it also doesn't mean you're special. And I think that's why people are sometimes wary of this kind of thing because in new age culture, there can be this idea, Oh, I'm, I'm special. I've had, uh, kundalini experiences or i I, i've smoked dmt or you know i i've i've met mama ayahuasca or 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 the holy spirit spoke to me you know on on the 5th of january 1992 and now you know and Mm -hmm. uh, and we can easily become attached to these experiences and spiritual inflation can easily come in with it and and in a way that's the risk of new age spirituality which people like William James and Aldous Huxley and Alan Watts helped to construct, they said like, well, we don't need religion and we don't even need community. Um, we will have a totally privatized spirituality of, of, of special experiences. And, and we, are, we, we, the elite, will have these kinds of experiences. So I think that can lead to spiritual inflation, feeling you're a bit special. And it can also lead to a kind of over-attachment uh, to these experiences where you're hungrily chasing them and going, ah, oh, it's time for another special experience. I mean, so I wrote, I wrote about ecstatic experiences for five years and I wrote a book called the art of losing control a philosopher's search for ecstatic experiences. And I ended up by, you know, going to an ayahuasca retreat for 10 days in the Amazon jungle, which completely blew my mind uh, and was fascinating. But now I honestly don't feel I need another ecstatic experience in my life. I kind of like, I almost feel it was immature of me to to kind of go chasing them um and and the, the, you know and, and i don't know um so it's always a bit of a balance but then the everyday becomes a bit boring and of course you you look for a bit of you know enthusiasm and fire but i don't know it's always just about having a, a balance in one's life isn't it mm. but i will say that um one thing that really struck me when i when i when i you know tried ayahuasca um is you you have this encounter with this kind of extraordinary intelligence and you don't know whether it's within you or beyond you but it it it's it seems to be kind of often it seems to be very wise and to know more than your conscious rational ego knows uh and that's something that the the psychiatrist rd lang noted like for example in our dreams how come our dreams sometimes seem to you know wiser than our everyday self it's this mysterious thing about the subconscious and someone like carl jung would say there is a wisdom within our subconscious and and in in things like dreams and trance states or even in prayer um, we are tapping into this subliminal intelligence and this subliminal healing Um, but what i noticed was when i was in this kind of you know ayahuasca trip and sometimes it was quite scary um some of the kind of stoic and Buddhist training I'd done was really helpful. Mm. Um, because I, you know, I would, I would be like, Oh, this is a bit scary. Am I going to go crazy? Am I going to come back for this? And I would remember like certain Buddhist or stoic maxims, like this will pass. Um, you know, I went on a, of a passenger 
Buddhist retreat and you get very trained in this idea of everything passes. And, and that was very helpful to me, that, that maxim uh, on, on ayahuasca. Um, and, and, and just the kind of, you know, I don't know, the, 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 the stoic and CBT training as well, like um, focus on what's in your control and accept what isn't. These kinds of everyday Socratic and Buddhist training helps you to steer through these, you know, slightly wilder waters. Um, so, uh, so, uh, you know, and there's a, there's a good study by the way, by, let's see if I can remember his name. Um, he's Swiss. Oh, I can't remember. Anyway, um, maybe I, I'll send it to you and you can put it in the links for the podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. But, um, and they did a study of, um, uh, a mushroom magic mushroom retreat with trained Buddhist meditators. Uh, and and a control group who uh, weren't uh, advanced Buddhist meditators, and they found that the, um, the Buddhist meditators um, had much more kind of uh, mystical experiences on the psychedelics, um, but they were also able to kind of integrate them better. So, in other words, the, the daily training of things like Stoicism and Buddhism, um, I think, um, helps you to kind of open up to these non-ego driven states and it, and then and then the daily training helps you to integrate them because i think it's very easy otherwise it just becomes a nice what, what aldous huxley called a holiday from the self you're like oh mm. that was nice you know but nothing changes in your life um yeah. but i think it there is a risk that we're, we're gonna become like in the 60s we will over fetishize psychedelics mm. and this is what happened in the 60s and like timothy leary was saying if you haven't taken lsd you're not initiated you can't understand I mean, it was like a religion of LSD. And, and I think after, if psychedelics become legalized, which I hope they do, and, and psychedelic therapy becomes normalized, you know, after a while, we all realize that, you know, we can access kind of subliminal intelligence and subliminal healing through all kinds of ways. I mean, that's what the placebo effect is. Mm. Um, uh, the placebo effect is, is uh, using a certain belief or ritual to tap into the remarkable healing powers of the subliminal mind. And, you know, psych psychologists and psychiatrists think about 80% of the, of the genuine healing power of antidepressants is the placebo effect. I would not be surprised if a lot of the impact of psychedelics is the placebo effect. Uh, mm. So these are all just... Um, means they're all kind of excuses for what's actually naturally there in our mind all the time uh, and you can get that also through meditation or prayer or you know um so uh, i think there is a risk of like of uh, of uh of us thinking psychedelics is like oh the the, the magic new thing which will so save us all and solve all our lives uh, and I suspect we will go into a kind of, well, we're in, aren't we? A period of psychedelic hype. Um, mm. And and let's not forget, the, the, it's not doing anything that isn't in our mind already. Uh, and there are many other uh, ways into that mind. Mm. Yeah, you, you, you could almost say that it it's, it's almost, I don't know what they're called. It's almost a defibrillator of humanity, right? It's that, it's that shock that just wakes you up again and, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Hey, you're hey right. you, you can do this, you know, Hey, Hey, this is within you. Uh, so you're why don't right. you take a you're little right. bit, you know, I, I agree. I think it's a kind of, I, there are comparables to electroshock therapy. Electroshock mm. therapy gives people a blast, which then loosens their, um, I mean, I think this is how it works, loosens the um, habitual associations in their brain. So it almost kind of shakes up. Do you remember those kind of cubes with, well, not the cubes, the things with snow in them? They're like little glass things with, uh, with, 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 with a little model in it and, and snow in it, and you shake yep, it up and yep. you watch the snow fall. So people have compared psychedelics to that, and electroshock therapy is like that too. So they're, they're sudden shocks which create a window for neuroplasticity, mm. uh, as in for changing your habitual neural pathways. But, yeah. um, I mean, Huxley and, and his friends, you know, talked about that. And they introduced some of these ideas, as did William James, to like the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill Wilson. And, and he thought one time, why don't we make LSD part of Alcoholics Anonymous? 
but they found also that even you just if you just surrender to a higher power which is one of the 12 steps in alcoholics anonymous it, it can lead to these kinds of ecstatic experiences where people feel born again even if mm. they're not even sure what they're surrendering to um and William James would say, yeah, that could be just the, the, the subliminal healing of the subconscious, or it could be the divine in some form. Who knows? Mm. But, um, so, uh, yeah, there, 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 as I said, there are many avenues into that kind of healing power. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I'd encourage people to explore that with the simple things like uh, music. You know, I mean, uh, yeah. I'll tell you like last night, this was a really interesting experience for me. I was, I was watching a video of a night at the proms uh, over there in London and uh, yeah. they were playing uh, this I- exquisite uh, song about, about Britain and everybody's waving their flags and um, <laughs> this full stadium and everybody's singing along with this beautiful orchestra. Oh, the music's perfect. Yeah. The vibe is perfect. Everybody is hypnotized into this one being. And yeah. when you see something like that, you, I, I actually, I began to cry when I was watching this last night because I was thinking yeah. it from, from the stoic perspective. It's like, this is humanity. This is what it means to yeah. be a part of a group of people yeah. who just yeah. want the best for each other. And, mm. and when you watch the music and you think every single one of these musicians has mastered their craft and together they are playing harmoniously to create this thing that is unbelievably ecstatic in, 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 in the experience that it gives. And Absolutely. To, to explore music like that and to just listen to your favorite song and to notice how you feel, that's yeah. a clue that this is within you already, right? Absolutely. And of course, I imagine, you know, there's a kind of pathos as well in watching that from from the situation now where we're not allowed to gather in that way Mm. so there's a kind of bittersweet pathos and that's that's partly what tragedy is too and there's something beautiful in tragedy and it's a weird thing why were the ancient greeks so into tragedy because stoics do not experience tragedy you know Mm. i mean the, the tragic hero might arrive at a kind of stoic wisdom right at the end but there's a poignancy to that kind of struggle and to the the fact of mortality and suffering and failure. And there's something in us that finds that beautiful as well. And, you know, but in terms of music, you're, you're completely right. And, and of course in Plato and Pythagoras, they were initiates in something called the Orphic mysteries. Um, They were followers of Orpheus, who was this kind of Greek demigod of, of music who could play music so beautifully. He could, uh, you know, tame wild animals. And they had this idea of music as being very healing to negative emotions and very powerful for connecting people together. And Plato said, you know, you can't change the music of a country. In other words, music is extremely powerful. And when you have a certain, you know, when Dionysus swept into uh, European culture, it was partly through music. It was a kind of new type of music. And you look at things like dance crazes in the 20th jitterbug or um, the twist (laughs) or, Mm. or, 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 or or acid house. These were new types of music that were ecstatic movements that completely transformed their culture. Um, And, and gave people access to new experiences, new forms of connection and to parts of their psyche that perhaps they didn't have access to in everyday life. And that is why people absolutely loved, for example, going to acid house raves or discovering rock and roll and the kind of, and the Beatles. Um, These are, these are very powerful things and, and, and not, uh, and, and potentially dangerous as well. Yes. But like, they are, they are, as you say, aspects of being human. They, they give mm. us um, uh, uh, everyday mystical experiences. Mm. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I, I think that this is a perfect place to wrap it up, even though I definitely have at least, you know, <laughs> 10 to 15 more questions that I would love to ask you. And I would love to spend so much more time with you, but I want to be respectful of your time. But, uh, 
Jules, I want to have you back as many times as you will come on the podcast because I think we can <laughs> continue this discussion in many ways. But sure. thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Simon. I, I enjoyed talking to you and I hope the sound was okay. The people doing roadworks outside. But um, yeah, I appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to sign up for email updates, join my Patreon meetup groups that we hold weekly, or if you'd like to offer feedback or suggestions for future guests or topics on the show, then you can head to simonjedrew.com. There you'll also find information about how we can work one-on-one together with my alignment coaching, based around the philosophical principles found in Stoicism. Finally, if you are on Facebook, then I'd love to see you in our group, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But hey, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I'll talk to you next time.